So good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to an exciting webinar with two very renowned, well-known scholars in international law. Uh, we're very happy, very honored to have with us Professor Jose Alvarez from New York. And good morning, Jose. And Professor Gary Simpson from London, from LSE. Um, today, the, the, the webinar, the discussion that I'm going to moderate is about the incoming Biden administration and to what extent the Biden administration is going to restore, rehabilitate international law, if I can say that. And uh, Jose, Professor Jose Alvarez is going to, provo to, to provide the thought provoking um, uh, uh, test testament about that. But before we start, I would like first to introduce Professor Jose Alvarez. Professor Jose Alvarez is professor of international law at my former school, NYU Law School. He's former president of the American Society of International Law and former co-editor-in-chief of the American Journal of International Law, member of the Council of Foreign Relations and also of the Institut de Droit International. Uh, he is one of the most proliferated international legal scholars on international investment law, uh, international organizations law, international criminal law, and other fields of international law in books and many, many, many articles. And on the right side, it's our pleasure to have as a discussion Professor Gary Simpson from uh, London School of Economics. Uh, Professor uh, Gary is a very good friend as well, a very well-known uh, scholar in international law, also in international criminal law, but with a very promising and exciting new book, forthcoming book on the sentimental life of international law. Having said that, after this very uh, short introduction, uh, I will give the floor to Jose, uh, to, to, to question to what extent the Biden administration will restore international law and what we should expect from that, what should be our expectations from the Biden administration, then Gary will discuss, will comment on uh, Jose's uh, keynote, uh, and then I will moderate the discussion between Jose and Gary, but for those of you who have comments and questions, please use the chat and then I will collect the questions for the Q&A time. On that note, I'm, I don't want to say take more time. Uh, Jose, you have the floor. Thank you once more for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria and Gary, for uh, participating in this. So at the outset, uh, you know, I was asked to be a sort of Cassandra, but remember Cassandra didn't have a very good fate at the end. Um, and also, I think it's always risky to try to predict things, think of what we would be predicting we would be doing uh, if uh, we were talking about this in 2019. And I think uh, most of us wouldn't have thought that most of the time would be on Zoom the whole year of 2020 and perhaps even more. Uh, the other thing I want to stress is these are predictions based on the political tea leaves, not necessarily what I would like. Uh, of President Biden to do. As far as, uh, so my talk is also, you can find uh, a version of it, at least an early version of it at the NYU website. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so we're welcome to go there. It will also appear as a far longer, much more footnoted uh, law review article that uh, deals with a number of other things that perhaps Gary and I can get into. As far as international law is concerned, I want to start off by saying that Trump was a consequential U.S. president. And even though many of us are celebrating uh, what we assume uh, is his defeat, and, and, and it is, is his defeat, the question is whether he'll actually leave uh, tomorrow, we'll see. Uh, but uh, many of us are celebrating that. Uh, and many of us uh, uh, think that this is promising in part because finally real international lawyers will go back to the room where it happens, uh, to quote both Lin-Manuel Miranda and John Bolton. Uh, but I want to uh, su suggest that expectations for a full-scale restoration of international law, at least insofar as the U.S. Uh, it calls this a normal restoration, has to be uh, tempered. And, um, and I would suggest that there are eight uh, foreign policy trends that are likely to outlast uh, Trump. And I'll quickly just go over them very quickly at the beginning in case I don't get to all of them. First is a preference for non-treaty commitments that don't require approval by uh, the Congress of the United States. Second, a more wary, hostile approach to China. Third, skepticism, the world trading system, the WTO. Fourth, continued reliance on trade sanctions to punish bad actors and bad being a definition that the US 
uh, will apply either because of human rights violations or simply because uh, uh, of uh, protectionist actions, for instance. Uh, fifth, a caution, disinterest, skepticism, depending on the organization of the UN system. Six, opposition to most forms of international courts and tribunals. Seventh, opposition to never ending wars, including the humanitarian use of force. One way of thinking about it is rest in peace for R2P or IIP, R2P. Uh, and finally, eighth, a ever more ironclad commitment to, Israelis, uh, to Israel's security. And that's just quoting straight from the Democratic Party platform. Now you can expect uh, Biden to modify each of these at the margins, a more measured diplomatic tone. But make no mistake, I would predict that four years from now, all of these uh, eight trends will be at least recognizable aspects of US foreign policy. And some of this is the product of the world that Biden has inherited, but some is the product of who Biden is. President Biden will not, uh, even though he has announced uh, already um, uh, many executive orders uh, to uh, systematically dismantle uh, what Trump has done, but that's not going to define his presidency. That is unlike Trump, uh, AKA termination man, who sought to undo all things Obama, uh, Biden is simply too careful, too thoughtful, too bipartisan, too rational, too respectful of the rule of law to completely just destroy everything that Trump did just for the sake of doing that. And it's particularly likely to be now after January 6, when he, his overriding effort has to be to unite a nation that is perhaps not an exaggeration to say, maybe on the brink of a political civil war and perhaps even a more dramatic one. And some are due to the fact that this is a, uh, a sort of tempered restoration of international law uh, is due to structural uh, factors or limits that are internal to the US, a more or less equally divided Congress, a more resistant conservative federal judiciary, thanks to Trump, path dependent civil servants uh, and limits on reversing federal regulations as opposed to uh, more quickly being able to get rid of executive orders. So just to start with the first one, I'll spend a bit more time on that one, that is uh, multilateral treaties. Uh, so the first hundred days of the Biden administration will not not be filled with the US joining uh, multilateral treaties that much of the civilized world uh, joined years ago. Even now, with Democrats just barely in control of the Senate, do not expect the U.S. to ratify the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the American Convention of Human Rights, the Rights of the Child Convention, the Law of the Sea Convention, or the Statute of the International Criminal Court. Do not expect the Biden administration to remove the U.S. reservations, all 14 of uh, understandings, declarations, and uh, reservations to the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, and even the U.S. reservations to the Torture Convention. Remember, this is a country that took 40 years to ratify the Genocide Convention. Uh, it, it's not a country that changes its spots all that quickly. And of course, much of the world, not only the U.S., has been considerably more uh, worry about ambitious treaty making uh, generally. He will, to be sure, fulfill his promise. Uh, he promises to do that on the first day to rejoin the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and he can do that uh, without congressional uh, approval. And he may pursue many other efforts to protect the planet that are consistent with one of the Pope's uh, encyclicals, Law Dot C. Um, and that may include reigniting the US and China uh, bilateral efforts to uh, address climate change. Uh, he, uh, the U.S. is likely to join China in pledging to lower the level of its carbon emissions by a date certain. Japan has done that as well. Uh, and there is some prospect that Biden could achieve those lower levels cha by, by changing the policies of the Environmental Protection Agency uh, and also uh, encouraging the U.S. states to mitigate uh, climate change even if Congress were not to pass the kind of dramatic legislation that might be desirable for that. Uh, and you could expect a President Biden to embrace related international initiatives that were rejected by Trump, such as the 2018 Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regularly Migration. Uh, this is a soft law pact, would need congressional authorization for approval, and it could uh, start to address the dilemma of climate change migration. 
And there are exceptional cases where I think you could imagine uh, President Biden attempting bilateral treaty efforts. He's certainly likely to try to return to a number of uh, nuclear uh, efforts that were uh, that were terminated or are about to be terminated under uh, uh, under uh, uh, Trump with respect to Russia. So that includes the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty uh, that Russia uh, uh, that was that Trump. Uh, terminated due to uh, Russia's violations. Uh, it could include the Open Skies Agreement. It could include the New Start. Uh, but what complicates that is not Biden's unwillingness uh, to do this. It's the complication of a much more deteriorating uh, set of relationships between uh, Biden and Putin, uh, which is, of course, widely uh, expected. But of course, Biden is far more worried about escalating the nuclear threat than Trump ever was. So there is some hope that you could see some movement on those bilateral initiatives with Russia. But, and there are many reasons for this, uh, for why a Biden administration goes for, so, uh, will go for soft executive agreements, soft law instruments, agency actions, instead of high profile multilateral treaties. We saw this through, uh, through the Obama years. Uh, that is the U.S. Constitution, Capitol Hill traditions make concluding treaties purposely difficult. Obama tended to go for international agreements that were ostensibly authorized already under existing law or under a previously concluded treaty. Uh, and Biden is also uh, facing the same uh, phenomenon. That is, he's not likely to find many members of Congress whose top priorities include ratifying a particular treaty. Let's take, for example, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. Uh, US has a huge interest in uh, uh, defending the law of the sea, and they're even stronger than ever before, given uh, potential threats uh, to that convention and perhaps even to international peace posed by China's actions in and around the South China Sea. And yet, no one, including me, predicts that the Biden administration will spend political capital to secure secure uh, U.S. ascension to UNCLOS, not only because I don't see uh, members of the Senate who really care about it to push for it, but also because the U.S., no less than China, has no present interest in using that treaty as a tool for settling law of the sea disputes through the modes of impartial international adjudication that that treaty to a certain extent compels. Another reason for this resistance to multilateral treaties is um, the populist mindset that propelled Trump to the White House and very nearly kept him in the White House. A Biden presidency is likely to prioritize what former uh, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright calls intermestic issues, international initiatives that have a clear domestic policy significance and therefore can draw support from the many sovereignists that dominate the US Capitol. Biden will never utter the phrase America first but that sentiment will compel him to justify everything he does in foreign policy in terms of how it benefits the people of the United States. In what could be just a single term, Biden will spend precious political capital on filling out our wish list as international lawyers only insofar as he can justify that it satisfies the interest of his target audience, think blue collar workers on Main Street. Reentry into the Paris Agreement is sold to the US public under a Biden administration on the basis that we need it to make sure that Main Street is not flooded, burnt to the ground, or torn apart by hurricanes thanks to climate change. The US return to the WHO and its global scripts for testing, contract tracing, and isolation will not be justified because of some abstract commitment to multilateralism, but on the simple basis that we need to do this to keep more Americans alive and Main Street open for business. And this turn to intermestic uh, law and domestic law initiatives to satisfy that can be to some extent a recipe for enhancing a bit US compliance with international law. Even without passing new laws, we can expect proactive efforts by the Biden uh, Justice Department to protect the rights of African Americans. Uh, and that will mean proactive enforcement of US civil rights laws encouraged by the Black Lives Movement. This will be changes to how law enforcement officers are disciplined and prosecuted for their actions at the state and municipal level. Greater prosecutions of threats and acts by white supremacists, 
rules that eliminate private prisons, that reduce criminal penalties. All this will enable the U.S. to have somewhat better answers the next time U.S. submits its reports to the CERT Committee or other human rights committees. Should the U.S. return to the U.N. Human Rights Council, as I think is likely, it may even support an attempt to appoint a commission of inquiry to investigate structural racism in law enforcement, including in the United States. And this attention to uh, unequal racial impact of the current pandemic, as well as climate change, will enable Biden to draw synergistic connections between some international human rights and his other interdomestic priorities. Uh, predicted efforts to defend the rights of organized labor, the right to strike, the right to organize, will elevate a bit uh, the credibility of the US uh, it, with respect to international labor rights and the ILO. Genuine efforts by the US Justice Department to correct and prevent pervasive forms of gender discrimination, the expected lifting of the US gag rule barring US aid to entities that support reproductive rights. These will enhance the credibility of the US before human rights bodies, even without the US joining CEDAW. And Biden, who as president got ahead of President uh, Obama by endorsing same-sex marriage, is also likely to embrace LGBTQ priorities identified in the Democratic Party platform. That means he will eliminate the transgender ban on military service. He will appoint senior leaders at the State Department, USAID, the National Security Council, for which uh, these rights are a priority. And of course, we've already seen that he's announced that he will eliminate the policy of separating immigrant children from their parents. He will attempt to reverse other Trump executive orders relating to immigration that include taking action on the dreamers. He announced that a possibility today. He will eliminate the revamped Muslim ban uh, and he will reverse some of the constraints on the exercise of the rights of asylum and non refoulement All of these actions will make the U.S. a bit more compliant with some human rights instruments, including the torture and refugee conventions. But it's more like 400 actions across a sprawling federal bureaucracy. And there's no way that Biden will get to really even look at, much less reverse all of those actions. So for that reason, I'm not sure that even four years of efforts will restore the mantle of the U.S. being truly a nation of immigrants welcoming to them. And there's also the possibility that some of these actions will be perceived as encouraging uh, uh, caravans like the one that's coming from Honduras. And the political reactions to that are unpredictable. But still, these under the hood changes in U.S. Uh, policies, Trump executive orders, and how U.S. Imp agencies implement the law without new multilateral treaties will be the principal way that a Biden administration will attempt, attempt, I say, uh, to restore the U.S.'s lost soft power on human rights. Second, more hostile, some would say sobering view of, of China. Unlike some of the advisors that were touted uh, to advise Biden who thought that it was just a matter of how China gets to global domination, Biden is more nuanced when it comes to China. But don't expect a full reset to the early uh, Obama years where there was still hope that China will uh, be a law-abiding member of the liberal international order. Uh, Biden has carefully described China as the U.S.'s principal adversary and sole strategic competitor for leading power status. He does not want clearly U.S.-China decoupling nor a descent into a new U.S.-China uh, Cold War. He will follow a Mao era expression to walk on two legs. He will treat China as a hostile power, as strategic competitor, or as an ally as needed to advance distinct US goals. A Biden administration will make clear that it will consider certain Chinese actions such as interference with transit rights on the high seas or threats to invade Taiwan to be unacceptable hostile actions against the status quo, but also signal that it wants to cooperate with China on matters of often global concern and not just on climate change to permit joint efforts against terrorism, spread of weapons of mass destruction or preempt uh, missile launches by North Korea. He will treat China as a strategic competitor in the race of winning hearts and minds in the developing world, 
Uh, and you could expect, for example, U.S. support for infrastructure development projects uh, that try to respond, and I suspect inadequately, to China's formidable Belt and Road Initiative. And part of this is not just about winning hearts and minds, but to resist Chinese efforts to export Chinese standards, including surveillance technology, that go along often with uh, Chinese aid and its foreign investments. Third, skepticism of the world trading system. The US's disenchantment with the WTO as a forum for negotiating new trade rules, as a place to effectively monitor protectionism, as an effective forum for resolving trade disputes. All of those disenchantments predate the Trump administration and will, I suspect, outlast it. There is bipartisan consensus, right or wrong, within the US that while the world has changed, the WTO has not. But Biden, like the U.S. business community, will not uh, have loose talk about leaving the WTO. Uh, he will try to re-engage in reform efforts. He has no interest in sliding down Trump's protectionist path, premised on tit-for-tat tariffs. And he particularly has no interest in imposing legally implausible tariffs on U.S. traditional allies like Canada or Europe. But steering that central path on the WTO will be rather challenging, given the Sanders-Warren wing of Biden's Democratic Party and concerns, uh, bipartisan concerns, that the WTO's rules are simply uh, ill-suited to liberalize trade in the age of digital trade, e-commerce, subsidized, forced tech transfers by non-market economies and their SOEs, unfair or are perceived to be unfair special concessions, given to countries like China because they're called developing countries and repeated failures by the WTO to police its members uh, and their contestable trade actions. Now, which part of a, of a huge WTO re reform agenda that he inherits, Biden will actually act on, uh, is a guessing game. Uh, despite skepticism of trade agreements that accelerated in the age of Trump, I would predict that a Biden presidency would probably seek renewal of fast track authority, which makes it much easier for the US to conclude trade agreements. That authority now expires in mid 2021. Uh, I suspect he will attempt, and this will take a huge lift uh, to get renewed authority, but it will come with new conditions imposed by Congress. And even if Biden were to win that battle of reauthorized trade promotion authority or fast track, He's not likely to use it in the short to medium term. And he pretty much has said that, that that's not what he wants to do, conclude new trade agreements until the U.S. gets its own act in order and protect its own workers. Uh, but he will face considerable business pressure uh, because U.S. business has been excluded from global supply chains under the new Regional and Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RECEP. And uh, you can expect a lot of pressure on Biden to try to go back to the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, that Trump foolishly abandoned, in my view, in his first days in office. But all of that will uh, be, uh, will encounter considerable resistance and require a lot of compromises. And it's not at all clear that the other 11 members of the TPP want to reopen that agreement just to get the U.S. in. If you do see new trade agreements. You can expect new types of provisions at the insistence of progressives in Congress, and that would include climate change mitigation provisions in trade agreements. Fourth, continued use of sanctions on bad actors. You can expect uh, the, uh, the Biden administration to keep in place many of the existing sanctions, particularly on China and Russia, but perhaps emphasize different rationales for them. He will keep certainly keep and perhaps escalate Russian sanctions because of Russia's prior interference in U.S. elections, its seizure of Crimea, the bounties put on U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan, and, and most recently, uh, Russia's alleged involvement in the solar winds hacking. You can expect trade sanctions on China uh, to be premised on the Hong Kong security law, on China's treatment of the weavers, less on the contention that China manipulates its currency or was responsible for spreading the so-called China virus. But these things would be, to some extent, a 180 degree shift from President Trump's reported statement 
to the leadership in China that building Weaver uh, internment camps was just the right thing to do. You won't get that kind of talk from a Biden administration. What about the UN system, my fifth tendency? Biden knows that few members of Congress or even the general public are invested in the UN. US disillusionment, disinterest in the UN preceded Trump and will outlast him. The only organization with a serious constituency on Capitol Hill uh, is NATO. Uh, and the only UN portion uh, of the show that American citizens know about is UNICEF because they donate it uh, during Christmas time. Still, unlike Trump, uh, Biden and his nominee for Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, realizes, I think, this, everything they've said, that disengagement with the institutions of international law and order weakens rather than strengthens sovereignty. He knows, as apparently Trump did not, that the absence of the U.S., from UN system in institutions leaves a void that other states, particularly China, fill. And, uh, and his nominee for UN ambassador, veteran diplomat Linda Thomas Greenfield, will certainly take seriously UN's, uh, the UN, re engage with the UN, including the Human Rights Council and the WHO. But Trump's withdrawals and wariness of such institutions, however misguided, uh, will uh, provide Biden with leverage and also impose some pressure on, on his administration to return to these organizations, but also uh, try to address U.S. grievances with them. The Biden administration will attempt to resume global leadership of what remains of the tattered liberal international order by insisting on institutional reforms to make these, quote, work as intended, at least work as intended as the U.S. would have them work as intended. So if reelected, to the UN Human Rights Council. You can expect the US will express displeasure over the council's recent decisions to admit China, Saudi Arabia, and even Cuba to its ranks, remind the council that its membership was supposed to take the human rights records of its members into account. He will resist China-led efforts to turn the body's universal periodic review into what I think many people now think it is, an empty celebratory occasion to commend human rights violators for their progress. And he will look into, and he will try uh, as a, a member to oppose recent council resolutions that for example, denigrate the need to protect human rights defenders. As far as the WHO goes, uh, he will try to fix the WHO, not leave it. As a re-engaged member of the WHO, the US will pay the dues that Trump withheld but also attempt to use that financial leverage to back institutional reforms. And also uh, to secure uh, something that China is apparently resisting, a genuine candid assessment of what the organization did wrong from the time the first COVID test emerged in China through to the present day. A president elected in my view, largely because his predecessor failed to contain a pandemic. You can count on that president to see threats to global health as a national security threat and act accordingly. And our new healthcare president is likely to take seriously the premise in the WHO's constitution that there is indeed a fundamental right to health. Unlike Trump, President Biden will agree that the failure of one state to prevent the spread of a contagious disease presents a common danger to all. All states benefit when each protects the health of its inhabitants. And like China's president, he will temper a bit vaccine nationalism by contributing to and joining COVAX, the alliance that tries to ensure that at least some vaccines uh, go to and are available to 92 low income countries. Number six, aversion to most international courts. Biden will only tinker at the margins with respect to US's traditional reluctance to submit to supranational forms of adjudication. Uh, he is not likely to resolve the stalemate over the WTO's appellate body merely by saying, okay, we'll just agree to appointment of new appellate body members. Uh, instead, he is likely to back proposals for some reforms of, uh, of that uh, body that were rejected by Trump that have been backed by a group of states. And I'm thinking of, of some of the reforms led by Ambassador David Walker of New Zealand. These reforms include a renewed commitment to judicial minimism in terms of WTO treaty interpretation. I'm not saying that exists, by the way. I'm saying that's the perception. 
uh, and, and are likely to be treated by the US as sort of a quid pro quo for bringing the WTO dispute settlement back to life. Uh, a very difficult symbolic issue is whether or not uh, China will agree not to be treated as a developing state. There, I would suspect that Biden will try a, a, a few trade-offs. China, he would argue, might be persuaded to acquiesce to such a change, which is more simple than anything else, given the few benefits that really mean much with respect to China. Uh, if the US were to accept recent panel holdings like US tariffs on certain goods from China, that ruling found that US tariff measures that were taken in response to intellectual property complaints uh, and that the US took these measures, uh, the, the panel found them to be illegal. A more sober USTR should accept, in my view, a ruling like that. And I think Biden might be inclined to do so. And as you trade representative might do that uh, to force the US uh, and its tariffs to be more carefully justified under the WTO's Article 20 and 21 exceptions. It would reflect, I think, an old fashioned idea that the US gets reciprocal benefits from avoiding transparently bad faith arguments to justify trade actions. A uh, Biden administration needs to demonstrate that the US still supports a rule-based system for trade after what I think and what I think Biden thinks more relevantly are disastrous trade wars initiated by Trump. But no one should expect that the US government to become a sudden convert to the virtues of other international courts. A Biden administration is no more likely than President Trump to sign on to the compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ. He will not submit to the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. He will not even accept, I suspect, or put any political capital in going into the ICCPR's protocol that would permit individual complaints against the US uh, to be brought before the Human Rights Committee. And he will not spend any time endorsing proposals for new global courts that some of which, or many of which, are popular with Europeans. A proposed World Court of Human Rights, an international environmental court, an international anti-corruption, anti-terrorism, or anti-trafficking court, a multilateral investment court, or an arbitration tribunal for business and human rights. Don't expect President Biden to spend any time on trying to make those a reality. At the same time, Biden can be expected to adopt a kinder, gentler policy towards the International Criminal Court, even while continuing to resist adherence to the Rome Statute, the Kampala Protocol, or uh, attempts by uh, the ICC to investigate crimes uh, in Afghanistan. The John uh, Bolton-inspired executive order that penalizes anyone who dares work for the ICC will be among the first of many Trump-era executive orders uh, to go. And I don't think you will see a revival of Article 98 agreements whereby the US will force states uh, to uh, the condition of aid uh, or assistance by the U.S. will be don't send uh, anybody to the International Criminal Court from the U.S. Seven, uh, uh, RIP to R2P. Uh, Biden was never a fan of Obama's decision to lead from behind with respect to NATO action in Libya. And like Trump, he will be adverse to starting and staying in never-ending wars, even for humanitarian reasons, I suspect that there may even be a change in US uh, national uh, security strategy uh, away from preemptive use of force. And uh, at the same time, you can expect uh, his administration will be more engaged in trying to make the UN Security Council relevant, if not great again. Uh, that is just maybe a cap on that. Security Council relevant again. Uh, and unlike Trump, he would support, for example, future Security Council action to respond to pandemics as, the, as a threat to international peace and security. Uh, after all, the council had already done that with respect to Ebola. And the eighth trend, ironclad security commitments to Israel. Biden uh, is expected to recommit to protecting Palestinian rights in any future Middle East peace deal. But uh, that now has to be undertaken in a new environment. US embassy relocated to Jerusalem an executive order recognizing the Golan Heights as part of Israel, the closure of Palestine's uh, diplomatic mission in Washington. Those are facts on the ground that will be, unlike other things that, uh, other things like uh, Trump executive order, that have some strong political support. It will be difficult to change, 
despite icier relationships uh, between Biden and Netanyahu. Uh, the U.S. under Biden will continue to encourage these bilateral peace agreements between Israel and its former enemies, like those concluded under Trump with Sudan, Bahrain, the UAE. And those agreements may further complicate any possibility of a broader peace deal. In, uh, in other words, the ironclad commitment to Israel's security that was proclaimed in the Democratic Party platform will continue to make the U.S. not at all a credible, honest broker for Middle East peace. And it will continue to complicate the U.S. relationship with a number of prominent forums that remain very sympathetic to Palestine. And that includes UNESCO. I don't predict the U.S. will return to that, uh, as well as many initiatives in the U.N. General Assembly. So where does that all leave us? Uh, it is a uh, tempered restoration of international law along the normal uh, approach to international law uh, seen in the US. And it is a, a restoration that will occur in a world transformed by Trump's years in office, anti-democratic trends around the world, including an established democracies, disenchantment with the UN system. The world, in short, has changed, and not just the U.S. in four years, and it's not just because of an ongoing pandemic. Uh, it is also because we have witnessed a paralyzed U.N. system that repeatedly fails to protect human life, whether in a conflict zone like Syria, on migrant-filled rafts in the Mediterranean, amidst forest fires in Australia or California, or, of course, in intensive care units around the world. Biden is heir to deep-seated skepticism about the efficacy of international organizations to address problems of the global commons. And that's just one reason why you should not expect uh, Biden to bring us to an effective third term of Obama with respect to foreign affairs. Uh, and there's other reasons for this. Uh, that is, he has difficulties returning to Obama era policies because Trump has managed to eviscerate trust that the US will keep its word or that when it keeps its word, that it gives its word, it can actually do what it promises. This alone will complicate any renewed efforts to seek the help of others, whether it's on climate change, restore, uh, restore respect for the WTO, uh, or, uh, or the WHO, close Guantanamo, render suspects accused of terrorism. It will take decades to restore a reputation lost in four years, even the US traditional allies are aware that nearly half of US voters supported a second term for an extremely unilateralist president. And that means that over half may yet elect in 2024, another unilateralist president that is just slightly more competent. That reality means that NATO members will welcome Biden's expected embrace, but continue to assume that in the future, they, will be, they better have a plan B uh, for securing Europe. No one can be sure how much time it will, gain, it will take to regain the trust of trusted allies whom we have spurned and really reset the tone of discourse with authoritarian rulers that we will now unfriend. And another complicating factor is that over the past four years, there's been a massive change in US foreign and intelligence services. Uh, Trump administration sidelined career diplomats, fired independent inspector generals, made enemies of foreign policy, policy, intelligence agency whistleblowers. Many distinguished public servants have resigned, have been forced out. He made a record number of political friends, incompetent ambassadors. As a result, the US Foreign Service has reportedly experienced the biggest drop in applications in a decade, thereby reversing any progress to recruiting a more diverse workforce. Today, only four of the US's 189 ambassadors are black. The Biden administration will undoubtedly seek to restore the value of a political intelligence, foreign policy expertise, compliance with ethical standards. He may be uh, trying to race RACE, US foreign policy, so that its diplomats actually look like the US. Uh, and such efforts may help to redirect attention to problems that we have long ignored, including uh, race, uh, as well as relationships uh, with parts of the world that we routinely ignore. But making diplomacy professional again, even if he were to distribute MDPA hats instead of MAGA hats, is just not a sexy topic. It will be a tremendous lift 
for an administration that is facing unprecedented other challenges that have far greater political salience. In the meantime, he has to work with a decimated State Department that he has inherited, including leftover deputies that have now acquired the status of civil servants and will not necessarily leave with Trump. If past is prologue, some of these officials will not immediately get with the new program. Uh, Trump's deep state, ironically, will live on. This time to delay, obstruct, and sometimes even possibly derail the new president's priorities. So where's the hope for even the restored uh, international law uh, uh, restoration? And that is the fraternity to deep part of the show. That is, this is likely to define the Biden administration and is likely to cut strongly, uh, most strongly, against Trump's erratic belligerence and perhaps resist some of the harshest parts of those eight foreign policy trends. And that is Biden's reliance on allies, his reluctance to go it alone in his climactic speech of the presidential campaign at Warm Springs, Georgia, Biden cited Pope Francis' latest encyclical, Fraternal Tutti, Fraternal Openness, defined as allowing us to acknowledge others and work with others. Of course, Biden's expected return to allies is not grounded in the fact that he's a practicing Catholic. It's grounded in geopolitical realities. The U.S. is no longer the sole superpower on the block. It needs the help of others. And that is basically Biden's uh, response to almost every question he poses on foreign affairs. His response uh, is, uh, he's no friend of Brexit. He wants to work with Europe. So perhaps uh, the, uh, the U.S. A UK trade pact will have to wait uh, while we uh, go forward with US European trade and elevate that. Uh, his response to the unfolding Pacific century, including the rise of China, is to strengthen allies with uh, uh, ties with key allies in the region, including Japan, South Korea, and Australia, to have robust engagement with institutions like ASEAN uh, and the quadrilateral security. Uh, dialogue, the quad uh, between US, Japan, Australia, and India. He will turn to a reinvigorated transatlantic partnership uh, in trying to find common solutions to big data flows while respecting privacy and to try to achieve greater energy security while combating climate change. And in this atmosphere, you can expect uh, attempts at greater Western uh, hemispheric cooperation in forums like the OAS trilateral dialogues between US, Canada, and Mexico uh, to address Biden's announced priorities in the Americas, and that is addressing the root causes of migration in Central America, protect the Amazon from deforestation, assist nations in this hemisphere, including the Caribbean, to adapt to climate change. This is all dramatically at odds with the unilateral inclinations of Trump. The search for allies is inherent in Biden's tendency to find common ground with political opponents, whether in Congress or I predict abroad. His instinct is to elicit consensus by emphasizing fact over fiction, science over QAnon, deference to experienced diplomats over businessmen, and they have been mostly businessmen with bank accounts. Uh, and I think that is why uh, there has been uh, a resurgence of faith among some international lawyers in the United States. And the 2020 election demonstrates, I think, once more, that US politics continues to be defined by a sharp divide between values voters who often identify as evangelical Christians and secular, largely urban elites on the East and West coasts uh, of the United States. Ironically, the presidential candidate that was most strongly backed by coastal elites turns out to be a practicing Catholic who in my view is apt to take seriously Pope Francis' call to defend common humanity and fraternity tutti and to protect the planet in the other encyclical Laudate Si. Our incoming president also seems inclined to take seriously those of us who still have faith that international law and its institutions can help achieve both of those goals. So for that reason, this is uh, an occasion to temporally uh, 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 and with caution celebrate. Thanks for listening. I look forward to the comments from Gary. Well said, thank you very, very much for this extremely fine uh, analysis. 
and I would say genuinely nuanced skepticism about the prospects of, uh, as you say, temporary restoration of international law based on the eight threats, threats you have identified and that they most likely will outlast uh, Trump, but also given on the restrictions both on the domestic front, such as the constitutional setting, or the sentiments, the mentality domestically, but also uh, regarding uh, the institutional uh, context. This, what we call the backlash, the, the lost faith in international institutions. So on this note, I want to give the floor to Gary for his provocative thoughts and comments. Gary, you have the floor. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not really sure how provocative they will be. Uh, <laughs> Um, but Maria, first of all, thanks for organizing this. I see we have a hundred participants, which is marvelous and um, perhaps not unexpected uh, for all sorts of reasons. But one of which would be that, that of course, tomorrow is a historic day in, in American politics and, and therefore international politics. So it's in that light that we um, were lucky to have that presentation. I mean, I learned a lot from that, but also from the longer paper, which I, I commend to anyone who's interested in, in the future of international law under Biden, who himself, I think, is quite a contentious figure. Um, not as contentious as Trump, obviously, but um, perhaps not quite the mainstream liberal figure that we uh, expect. Um, so, I mean, my questions uh, are comments, really. One is one is a is a is a sort of epistemological question, or maybe a sort of research question, if you like, um, which is is you know how do how do we know what what we know about about Biden? Um, so I guess I'm asking you, Jose, you know how you know all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, you know, what's the, or, you know, to, to, to ask the sort of question that a certain type of scholar might ask, what's, what's, the, what's the relevant archive here? I, mean, I, I noticed that there were a, a number of papers from foreign affairs and so on. Um, some of it, as you say, is, is sort of guesswork. We don't quite know precisely how Biden and his administration will operate. Part of it is with reference to how the Obama administration work, given the crossover in personnel, part of it is about the, the internal workings of the of the Democratic Party, uh, and part of it is related to the sorts of constraints that operate internationally, and I think also domestically. And here I found the paper very, very useful to try and understand just what sorts of barriers lie in the, in, the, in the way of any Biden rethinking or reconceptualizing or even remaking of international law. So that, that would be a, an initial question. The second point I'd make is, you know, what, I mean, it's the oldest question in the book, but, but it's a kind of what is international law question. Uh, it seemed to me that there were a lot of different sort of international laws floating around in the in the paper. So at one point in the, in the talk, you said uh, uh, that, that, that we wouldn't we wouldn't get a wish list for international lawyers from Biden. And I guess my question might be, um, what is that wish list? And, and do we all have the same wish list? So so, for example, the international law you describe, uh, which is, you know, an international law of tribunals, the WTO, the ICTY, the ICTR, you, you talked about the ICJ, it's an inter international law of multi multilateralism, it's an international law in which, say, R2P plays quite, you know, a relatively prominent role. I know that you have your skepticism about this as well, and you've got what, what Maria called a nuanced view of this, as with so many things, but but I wonder if that's a very particular international law that wouldn't necessarily be shared by lots of people. So that you can imagine uh, international lawyers, not of the Trumpist variety, who might be quite skeptical about courts or tribunality and might not think of judicial institutions or dispute resolution mechanisms as sitting at the heart of international law at all. That international law might be much more of a sort of private public affair or much more of a bilateral, as you, I mean, you talk about this in your paper, much more, much more bilateral than say multilateral. And that what we're being presented with in the paper is partly 
a sort of classic multilateralist tribunal, a, a particular type of, of liberal international law. Ne never mind all the other international law laws that might float around, like, you know, a critical international law, feminist international law, third world international law, where there might be a number of different concerns. And those concerns might be related to the problematic of liberal international law itself, of course, as you as you well know, so that the, the restoration of that international law would not possibly be met with a great deal of enthusiasm in the first place. I have to say that critical international law and, and third world international law would be very torn about the uh, Biden presidency because you know Trump Trump puts people who are, puts the critics of international law in a slightly tricky position. Because um, sometimes, as many people have said, cr critics of international law sound like John Bolton. So no one wants to sound like John Bolton. No one wants to sound like Donald Trump. And yet some of the positions seem at least superficially similar. So the restoration of international law is both a sort of ambiguous enterprise for many, many people, but also a very complicated one because it's not clear to us what sort of international law is being restored. And, that's why I, I found, uh, I, I thought it was a strength of the paper, actually. That's why I found the reference to Pope Francis and what we might even call, though this would be quite a historical, I suppose, a Catholic conception of international law, not the first one. I mean, it's not 500 years old as well. And I think the, the links between current papal pronouncements on internationalism, if you like, and those more historic ones would be a really productive sort of research agenda of itself. It's not something that I re remotely propose that you'd have to do in this paper, but it's something that others might might want to take take up of the sort of one one hundred guests guests we have here. So, so I think that's a question I have as well. And it's you know it's partly a question of the of, of style. What style of international law we want? We, we may want international law to do lots of things, but. How do we want to adopt? I mean, is, is there any real reason to prefer the UN over the quadrilateral security dialogue? Um, uh, is there any reason to disparage what you actually described at one point as these other normative projects the Trump administration uh, adopted? I mean, in, in content, we might not like it, but I wonder to ask of the, you know, take up to take up Maria's uh, request, to ask a provocative question. Is there anything we can learn from the Trump administration? I mean, it sounds very strange given the events on, on Capitol Hill, an almost uh, mystifying question, but is there anything we can learn from how Trump did international law? Was there anything creative there? Is there anything that can be retrieved? So that would be the first uh, or sort of second question I might have. Um, the third is a, is a big question about internationalism uh, uh, and about whether whether history is with Biden or Trump, um, there's been a lot of concern about the liberal international legal order and political order, John Eikenberry and so on, uh, and the question about whether we're coming to the end of it and whether Biden's retrieval of it will turn out to be um, somehow anachronistic or exceptional in itself, whether the winds are actually blowing in a different direction, whether we're moving towards sort of populist extra legalism um, or whether we're moving back to sovereignism. Uh, and I guess that even raises a question about whether these forms of sovereignism themselves are sort of built into the structure of international law, which has always understood itself to be a conversation between sovereignism, maybe even populism and multilateralism and internationalism. So whether a sort of broad conception of international law um, so it takes in all of these positions somehow, whether this is a debate internal to international law rather than a debate between sort of international lawyers on one hand and recidivists who just can't stop breaching international law on the other hand, the, the sort of Trump and his supporters and so on. So that would be the the second, the second question. Um, the third point, at least I think it's the third point. Um, I just wonder what effect that Trump, and again, you touch on this in the paper, what effect Trump will have on Biden's 
ability or the United States authority to now intervene in international affairs. So, you know, the, the paper does what many of us do, which is it sort of speaks from a, a center outwards uh, and sort of asks questions about how we might control Iran or North Korea uh, or deal with the Middle East or ISIS and so on. And also how we might try to understand what you call the WHO's um, failings. But I wonder from the rest of the world if that's the way it now feels or is experienced. Uh, I wonder, just to speak from the United Kingdom, Britain still imagines itself to have a certain degree of authority and weight in international affairs. But I think it's squandered some of that uh, in recent uh, years, maybe even decades, going back to the, the Iraq war under Blair, but certainly under Johnson, who doesn't seem to have a good feel for internationalism, um, Brexit being just the latest example of that. And, and though we feel the need to pronounce on vaccines and so on, the British really have lost their authority on COVID. It's, it's, it's dealt with a, you know, with, with world historical disastrousness. And, and yet we keep having this reflex of saying, no, we're gonna ban flights from Portugal because they're dangerous out there, or we need to reprimand the WHO for its failings. And yet I just wonder if we have the, we have the authority to do that anymore. Um, I don't wanna bombard you with a million questions. So let me, let me just come to some sort of conclusion. I, I really do want to get into the issues of friendship and the idea of this Catholic conception of international law, because I. I found them so interesting, and there has been quite a bit of writing on friendship in international law and relations over the last over the last ten years. But my my last question is really about the relationship between um, Biden and your portrait of Biden, and you know the internationalists rather than internationalism. Uh, you, you 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 refer to businessmen with big bank accounts being very important under Trump. Well, but of course, businessmen with big bank accounts are very important to that story that Scott Shapiro and Una Hathaway tell about internationalism in general, going back to the, the Kellogg-Briand Pact. And I, 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 just, I think we can set aside the whole Kellogg-Briand argument because not that many people, certainly in my circle, take that part of the story very seriously. But the other part, which is that something called internationalism developed in the 1920s and continues to be something wor worth holding on to is very, very important. And there are lots of debates about that. And I wonder where you situated um, Biden in that particular story of internationalism. In fact, where you, where you situate your own paper in that, in that particular story of internationalism. So that, I mean, I just, I just, I read your paper alongside a piece by Tor Craver in the New Left Review, which was a, a, a absolutely vicious review of, of the Shapiro Hathaway book um, from a kind of left critical perspective. It was so interesting reading sort of Shapiro on one hand, you on the other, and Craver on the other. Because you've uh, you know occupied an unusual position in the International Legal Academy, one that I'm you know quite sympathetic to, the idea of trying to steer some sort of middle position between the triumphalism of the Hathaway, the Hathaway uh, Shapiro School of Internationalism, and the skepticism of critical international law. Wow. Uh, so, okay. So uh, let me attempt to address some of them. The first one, I think, is the easiest one. That is, how do we know all of this? Well, in the case of Biden, we do have probably the longest career trajectory of any candidate for president in a long time. Mm. We have a lengthy record in, as head of foreign affairs, a uh, lengthy record as vice president. And now, an increasing uh, evidence that I didn't have when I started the paper, uh, but I would have predicted of the types of people he is now seeking to nominate, uh, and, in, and, and now with uh, just enough democratic control, that my prediction is all of these will eventually be confirmed, with the possible exception of the Secretary of Defense for particular reasons that don't affect uh, so much foreign, uh, foreign policy. So we have the people, we have his career, 
And among the people, we also have uh, uh, Biden's longstanding allies on the Hill. So somebody like Senator Chris Murphy, who's likely to be quite influential in terms of foreign affairs, uh, he's the one that says, look, uh, the Biden people and I in Congress will prioritize the US-EU relationship over the US-UK trade deal. That's getting pretty specific, mm. but that's an indication of where Congress is likely to be and not just the Trump administration. When we have Anthony Blinken making statements, not just now, but others in the past about Brexit being a total mess uh, and what a disaster that was, that tells us something about the Biden administration's likely approach, uh, including not just to Brexit, but perhaps to Boris Johnson, right? So we do have quite a bit of tea leaves to search through not all of which were the subject of footnotes, right? This was a, originally a speech. Uh, I'm not sure if you got the law review version of it with all the footnotes. Uh, mm -hmm. Even that won't give you won't give you all of that. So there is quite a bit. It doesn't mean that my predictions are accurate. It means that I'm basing it on sort of traditional tea leaves, and we have a lot of them in the case of Biden. We have a lot less with respect to Kamala Harris, right? So if something were to happen to Biden uh, and she becomes president, then I have a lot fewer basis of predictions based on she has barely made a dent in foreign policy. She was not vice president, et cetera, right? So that's that. The harder question that you pose is um, what's my uh, style of international law or what's the basis for this? So I guess what I am trying to suggest when I, talked about the wish list of international lawyers uh, and their likely reactions to my eight foreign policy. I'm sitting in the office of Tom Frank. And so I'm thinking, what would Tom Frank think of these things? So I'm thinking traditional, progressive, international defenders of the liberal international order. Tom Frank was not a bomb thrower, but he was sympathetic uh, to critiques of international law. He was not unlike me. Maybe it's good that I'm in his office. Uh, and But I'm also suggesting that these are predictions based on what I know of Biden and predictions based on what would be the reaction of, oh, let's just take Anne-Marie Slaughter. Uh, that is, uh, if you take a, a survey of the 25 uh, editors of the American Journal of International Law, uh, do they back international courts? Yes. Do they back multilateral treaties? Yes. Would they like us to sign all the human rights treaties in sight? Yes. Uh, would they like it if we were actually more involved than we were uh, on a number of institutional fronts? Where things get a little dicey is the details of how you carry out the goals, as you rightly point out. And many of them would be just equally sympathetic, not just to the UN system and traditional international organizations, but to using the Quad, to using G7, G20. Uh, in that case, uh, they have certain goals in mind, whether it's encouraging the SDGs and how do we achieve that and using the tools of international law. And you could get differences of view with respect to that. Uh, so you are quite right that this is not the wish list of toilers, for instance, uh, nor the wish list of, say, uh, uh, conservative international lawyers in the United States, such as uh, Curtis Bradley or Jack Goldsmith, right? Uh, so they wouldn't care if we uh, adhere to a multilateral treaty or not. Uh, and, and to some extent, the fact that you have international lawyers of varying persuasion on questions like that helped me to predict that there will be less push for ratifying CEDAW because the answer of a moderate like Biden will be, well, if I can accomplish the goals of gender uh, equality, uh, at least within the confines of US law, let me try that first uh, rather than spend the political capital to ratify a treaty that the conservative international lawyers will say is just trying to get rid of Mother's Day, according to the uh, the committee on uh, CEDAW, right? Uh, so 
so that's the that's the the sort of political calculation. You are uh, in the set in the longer version of the law review article. I do hint that many of the things that a Biden administration will try to accomplish uh, will actually generate considerable pushback, mm -hmm. including by a lefter, uh, by a Twaler, for instance, uh, and 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 not just. Uh, Remember, Twailers happen to be mostly critical lawyers writing in a third world perspective who happen to live in the United States and Europe. I'm talking about, uh, is there gonna be resistance on the ground in African states among the governments and perhaps the peoples of, of countries? And I would predict yes. I think if the US were to push certain reforms of the WHO that prioritize expensive uh, global scripts for testing contract tracing and isolation, and you're sitting in a country that has uh, other issues uh, and would like, uh, for example, uh, to investigate the causes of uh, diseases that migrate from uh, animals uh, to people, and maybe we should prioritize that uh, rather than uh, some of these other techniques. Or if you're sitting in a Vietnam, uh, where, which has been relatively successful with respect to controlling COVID, but not through the traditional means that you see in many other countries. So I don't, and that is why I try to be careful in both the paper and in my speech of saying he will try to do these things, but it actually could generate resistance. So they're very reforms. So the, the part of the paper on UN integrity, right? So the Trump administration, and here you're asking me, what do we learn from the Trump administration? So for example, I think the Trump administration was, uh, was right that it is not an unallied glory that China is now in control of some four UN system institutions. And the way some of those elections were conducted uh, through uh, supervising in, in the worst fashion of say the US Cold War uh, that you are well familiar with, where everybody keeps track of who's voting for whom, and then everybody gets punished for the wrong vote. China is basically deploying those old tactics that the US itself and Russia did with respect to UN elections. And so it wasn't wrong for the Trump administration to point it out that, uh, that China was undermining uh, whistleblowers uh, and the integrity of UN elections. But let's face it, what credibility does the Trump administration have on both fair elections and protecting whistleblowers? Now, I would predict that a Biden administration will try to pursue comparable program with slightly more credibility, at least to the extent it is perceived not as just dumping on China, but actually as trying to maintain a, a less politicized in, uh, civil service uh, and elections where, uh, where it's not quite as politicized as they have been. And also, uh, I think you can expect Biden to attempt, and I'm not sure successfully, to restore the observer status of Taiwan uh, in, say, a place like the WHO, which I think benefits not just the WHO, but Taiwan itself. Uh, so, so all of this is by way of suggesting that you're correct, that there's going to be resistance and not just resistance because the US will be pursuing a particularized view of what international law is. But on the other point that I think I, I tried to raise, which is that the US has no credibility, uh, has squandered its leadership with respect to COVID, with respect to human rights, with respect to elections, what country is now gonna buy uh, any premise that the US uh, uh, respects free and fair elections? I mean, I, I, that you know, unless there's a global amnesia about January 6th that's gonna take place through a global pill that we distribute, no one is going to believe us. Uh, and that's what I mean in part by the lost reputation. That is, if we've lost credibility uh, in competence, we've lost credibility in, uh, in principles, uh, and this is just attempts at the margin to try to restore it, and it will take more than one election, because if we get you know, another unilateralist in four years, this will be, as you say, a blip uh, on this, which means that you are maybe quite right, that we are just talking about uh, a blip in an overall a decline of the liberal international order, 
Uh, and if this is not the beginning of the end of populism, uh, but just a temporary stopgap uh, where not just the US but other countries will return uh, to a, a place where, uh, and here's one difference I do think between Trump and Biden, that is what you see with a Biden and an Obama is you're going to see a steady attempt to justify whatever we do through international law. Uh, and that will mean memos uh, that will sometimes be totally implausible. So I never bought Harold Coe's attempt to argue that drone killings were better, uh, killing them is better than torturing them somehow. Uh, I, I, I found that uh, uh, untenable. However, we tried to make the argument and by making the argument, we then can generate a discussion about this. But if you don't try at all, which is frequently the Trump effort, and you just assert, sometimes on the basis of totally made up facts, uh, you're not even playing on the, on the traditional playing field of using law to justify your actions. And so I think we're going to be back to that. The other reason that I think is different uh, from Trump is that there will actually be more of a demonstration of what is the US position. Mm -hmm. That is frequently you had Trump tweeting something at 5 a.m. that was completely different than the intelligence services uh, and everybody else. So somehow the solar winds hacking was China, not Russia in Trump's view, thereby obliterating, uh, obliterating all kinds of consistency in terms of the credibility of US policy or what that policy was. You can bet that there will be a more consistent tone. It could be wrong, uh, but it'd be more consistent across the administration, across the various agencies. The speaketh with one boy fifth uh, business that the, the Supreme Court always tried uh, to protect in terms of US presidential voice will be back. Uh, and, and, and that means that there'll be a target for when you think that presidential voice is wrong and, and you can actually address it that way. Uh, as to whether the liberal order is on decline uh, altogether, uh, I'm not sure my crystal ball extends uh, to that. Uh, I do think that one of the issues here is how much institutional reform is actually conceivable or possible, or are we too embedded in, for example, state centricity uh, that we can't adopt the changes to uh, something like the World Health Organization that would open it up to where I think it needs to be opened up so that it takes the advice of frontline medical workers, for instance, or, and it separates out operational activities to Doctors Without Frontiers or to other agencies mm. more capable of doing this. So that one key for the WHO would be to separate out some of its functions. I think the, Japan has articulated a position like that, uh, that uh, we would expect the WHO to prioritize some of the things it does, uh, maybe fix the proclamation of a public health emergency of international concern, uh, focus on trying to be more or less consistent in terms of global guidelines, um, and perhaps change a little bit uh, it's, uh, the way it comes to those guidelines. So right now, I think the WHO is still late to the game when it comes to mask wearing, uh, when it comes to travel restrictions. Uh, and it's mostly because uh, at various points in time, it was relying on proof positive. Tell me proof positive, scientifically documented that masks help. Tell me proof positive that a ban on travel from the following countries helps. Without thinking about the sort of the equivalent of precautionary principle in this field, which is, hey, uh, if it might help, maybe you ought to encourage uh, mask wearing until we find out otherwise, right? And so I think that ironically, the WHO is too embedded uh, in the scientific community to some extent uh, and not willing to consider political advisors and even lawyers advice uh, uh, with respect to these things, but also separate out, as I say, some of the, uh, some of the other 
challenges. I've been around the UN reform effort for way too long to be optimistic about any of this. Uh, I, I never, you notice I'd never said a word about Security Council reform. What a joke that is, right? So mm -hmm. I'm not even going to think about Security Council reform. But is there enough reform of some of these institutions, whether it's the World Bank, the IMF, uh, or others, that make me uh, think that they could still survive? So, for example, if there is a Beijing consensus uh, emerging from how to encourage the achievement of SDGs uh, through development assistance, that is, that is less, that is not like the Washington consensus, and it's almost the exact opposite. And if that turns out to work, then maybe that is the way we ought to take lessons. Just like you encouraging us to take lessons from the Trump administration, we could take lessons from China. Uh, in the paper that the long version that you have, you have a section on where I go through the Pope's uh, fraternity tutti uh, encyclical. Uh, and the Pope certainly has a, a policy agenda uh, embedded in it. Uh, the Pope is the one that would prioritize multilateral institutions. The current liberal institutions should work as intended. In the Pope's view, reforms to them uh, should be encouraged so that the most vulnerable states uh, are, are uh, and their needs are elevated as opposed to the more powerful states, which is why he elevates multilateral initiatives uh, as opposed to bilateral ones. But it is a particular agenda. And I used it as, OK, if we follow the Pope, because I am well aware of the competing strands of international lawyers, different recipe books, well, what would that look like, right? And it was sort of fun to think about the Pope as president of the United States, frankly. I mean, it's just, it was such a, a, a refreshing take. But you're quite right. If, uh, if you were to take a different view of how you achieve the SDGs, for instance, without multilateralism, uh, it wouldn't look like the Pope's recipe book, right? It could involve working uh, with completely different non-state actors uh, throughout bilateral approaches. So if, if you, and then and, and then the question you ask, and I do want to hear from uh, uh, the chat box, um, what have we learned uh, from the Trump administration? Well, one thing we've clearly learned is that if you do everything the way that I fear uh, Biden will do, uh, it will not last. So that the ignoring Congress and doing things through executive order means that they will not last. It is much harder to get out of a treaty that Congress has entered into. And of course, under US law, it is possible for the president to do that unilaterally. But politically, it is much harder to, to terminate a treaty just as president that the Senate or the House and the Senate have jointly given their approval for. So Trump has shown us the inadequacies of the Obama approach. Now, in defense of Obama, it wasn't clear that he had an alternative once the Republicans took control of, of, uh, of the, the Senate, then it was very hard for him to get anything done. But it is true that Trump has, I think the other thing that, that is quite true is also uh, to some extent uh, Trump's um, breaking of all norms made it easier for people to question particular approaches, not just whether China was a, a, a rule abiding status quo, but is the WTO really the best approach uh, for getting to a uh, new trade rules? So I think there's greater skepticism, including in the new administration of a number of, uh, of institutions and practices that there was before. Uh, and that's all to the good uh, provided you do something about it that is realistic. The problem with Trump is he may have pointed out these things, but he didn't do anything about them. And he tended to exacerbate the very problem uh, that, you, uh, that he may have pointed out. So yes, pointing out that the WTO is a disaster when it comes to dealing with five, six, and seven should, okay, then do something about it that would help you work with others to achieve those goals 
we never saw that sort of follow through on any of the Trump uh, criticisms of the existing international order. And I know I didn't uh, answer everything, but that's as far as I'm getting right now. No, yeah, yeah, you did. You did. You did. You did answer. You did answer. I just I had one little comment to make. I, when I read the uh, the uh, the Pope's position on some of this, it reminded me a little bit of the book that John Rawls wrote on the uh, on the laws of peoples. We had this sort of great philosopher coming down from the mountain and presenting us with the uh, with the very latest liberal philosophy on international law, which turned out to be almost exactly like liberal international law. And I, it felt to me as if the papal pronouncement was a bit like that. Uh, it was more or less what we had or what multilateralism is at least imagined to be amongst um, international law supporters. But Maria. Um... Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I, I was following your fascinating discussion back and forth. Gary, I was pretty sure you would say something about liberal. Uh, mainstream liberal uh, <laughs> multilateralism. I was I, I was to avoid that phrase. Yeah, I was waiting for that. You know, uh, here we are. Uh, and Jose, thank you so much for your response. And uh, I have to say that several times myself, I wonder what would Tom think today. What would Tom think? What would he say about that today? Books are behind me because I inherited half his library. On occasion, and there's a written remark on the margins. Yeah, and I remember working in this uh, room, you know, when I was doing my research for him. Um, I, I, we, we just have less than 10 minutes. So what I did was I was collecting some comments for Jose, for you. And then, uh, unfortunately, we, ha we have to, to, to conclude. And maybe, you know, I will conclude with one sentence. So uh, in the, in the Q&As, you know, uh, there are several people. I saw Cesare Romano is, is attending as well. So he was asking about uh, the Inter-American Commission, you know, uh, and uh, your um, guest, I would say everything is now to what your guest, you know, to what extent the Biden, Biden administration, I'm collecting everything, will have a different position towards the inter-American system, to what extent, you know, he will, the administration will reiterate a different relationship with BRICS, uh, to what extent, these are issues you have touched upon as well, you know, about the sanctions against the ICC officials, our colleague Megan Furley is asking that, which was unprecedented, uh, but also issues uh, with regard to the EU. Basically, it's everything about uh, friendship to some extent, you know, it's what Gary said about international law and friendship, uh, how he's going to, uh, I don't know, to rethink about all these relationships. So if you can, if you have any word, I know you touched upon that on your papers and you're also. So I would predict uh, more generally that human rights will get a far more higher priority uh, and will be dealt with more seriously. So that if, for example, the Inter-American Commission were to issue uh, criticisms of existing immigration uh, policies and so forth, uh, I would predict that this administration uh, will either try to correct whatever the commission is pointing out, but will at least engage with it in terms of legal arguments and what uh, customary international law does or doesn't require, since the US isn't a party to the American Convention, but it is a party to the American Declaration uh, of, of Human Rights. I would also expect, and this is a key thing, that the US will actually try to fill, to the extent it can, positions that are now vacant throughout UN system organizations. The US is not a party to the Inter-American Court, but it can have a role in the Inter-American Juridical Committee in all the variety of settings. Uh, and I, last time I checked, uh, a lot of these positions were left vacant, uh, right? And I think what you could expect is serious international lawyers uh, being uh, appointed to those that require uh, legal background. Uh, and it matters. I happen to think, and this is, I'm old fashioned that way, that that having the U.S. at the table uh, in a serious way in all of these institutions, which includes the Assembly of State Parties, for example, as an observer in the ICC, makes a difference, not always to the good, uh, but we saw the difference it can make, good or bad, if you look at the Kampala uh, Agreement on aggression. That is, a lot of it was influenced, including the understandings 
by uh, Harold Cohn as an observer there. And the truth is, in the past four years, we have been present, I understand, at the assembly of state parties, but have mostly been silent and not sent uh, people of the kind of elevation uh, and seriousness of somebody like Harold Cole. And there, for example, uh, the ICC has a huge agenda for reform coming out of its independent commission that the assembly of state parties asked and this is a, a, an interesting document uh, that is quite damning about how the International Court, uh, 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 the International Criminal Court, and its prosecutors handle the prioritization of cases, manage uh, the relationship between judges, uh, handle evidence, a variety of things, uh, all of which are low-hanging reform fruit, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and what it takes is serious people going through them. And that includes sensitive points about, are they really prioritizing the types of cases? With respect to some of the, so what you could expect, uh, and this is just a prediction, is that in the assembly of state parties, for instance, the US would probably no longer advance the implausible position that it took under the Bush administration, that it is illegal uh, for a state uh, to send uh, U.S. nationals to the court who happen to have committed uh, a genocide or crimes against humanity or war crimes in its territory, that that's somehow illegal. I don't think this administration will, will make that with a straight face. So what will they say about Afghanistan? Well, they'll say something like this, and this not necessarily publicly, but in the corridors. Look, guys, we're going to be prosecuting one Republican administration already. You want us to tackle another Republican administration for torture allegations that are quite publicly well known. That is, we had congressional uh, testimony on all of this. We have a huge record of everything from John Yu's memos, uh, uh, elucidating torture. Uh, and we and and ever since Obama, we said we were not going to do this. But Obama was the one that closed the avenue for prosecuting these people. You want to reopen that politically. We're not going to reopen Obama's decision to prosecute these people. And frankly, we think you have more current uh, war crimes and other things to address than that. Um, and that's the answer, right? Whether the, the Biden administration will seriously pursue this question of we're an exceptional nation that has to be exempt from all of this because we're present all over the world. I think they'll probably downplay that, but they may believe it, by the way. I mean, this is part of having a traditional, uh, sort of a traditional foreign policy establishment, uh, which is what Biden is restoring. But what gives me hope is that at least these are people who are not given their jobs because they donated to the campaign and no, no squat about foreign affairs or international law. You could accuse that whole cabinet list that the New York Times published, everybody that is there. You can't suggest that these people aren't competent, right? You may disagree with them on the margin about policy, but A, they have a record. They're mostly public servants of longstanding. Uh, and I doubt that you will have the kinds of scandals of ethics that we have just gone through to great exhaustion, by the way, um, over the past four years. So you, you will see a steady hand uh, and steadiness uh, has some merit um, uh, on this, uh, but, but whether the US, uh, so I, I've already suggested that I don't, I see this as a restoration to some extent of the old status quo, not a radical move, uh, 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 even though principle, you could see it. That is, remember the, the, the constraints on getting through human rights treaties under US law uh, that suggest you have to go with two thirds of the Senate, which is a very high hurdle, is a political constraint. You could decide to pursue those treaties through half of the House, half of the Senate. You just have to convince them that the Senate to give up those uh, priorities. Uh, and I suspect that this is not something the Supreme Court will strike down if they decide to join CEDAW 
the way they decide to join trade agreements. Um, that's a political calculation, not one embedded in the, the U.S. Constitution. So, uh, so that's what you know. If you had a more transformative uh, president who's willing to strike a new deal on international law, like FDR struck on some things, uh, it could happen. Uh, the constraints uh, that I've talked about are, uh, to some extent, political, not legal. Thank you so much, Jose, for that. Gary, would you like to add something? Or no, I don't have much, this, have much to add. I know you, you've run out of time. I mean, I, I, I suspect um, what might happen to multilateralism, which I, I think of as a very diverse project, is, is that it'll start to feel, multilateralists may feel a certain amount of nostalgia for the Trump era when we could agree on one thing. We didn't like what he was doing. But when it comes to constructive projects of multilateralism, I think disagreement may begin to flourish again. I mean, I, I think it's, it's the sort of nostalgia punk rockers have for Margaret Thatcher, for example. It's, it's just that, that, that galvanizing figure. Right, right. No, I think that, that, that's, that's certainly true. We knew who the enemy was, uh, what the restoration project should look like. That's a, a far more contentious question. And it is one that will, will raise a serious uh, divisions in the Democratic Party itself, mm -hmm. right? So this is why that part of it is unpredictable. You have you know, varying views not just on international affairs, but on domestic affairs mm -hmm. among this big tent called Democrats, uh, which by the way, may become a little bigger uh, since January 6th. Yeah, very, 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 very true. Well, uh, on this note, I would like to, to wrap up, to conclude. First of all, I want to thank you. I want to urge all the participants to read your, uh, your uh, law review article, which is at the website of NYU. And I can say that personally from, from while I was reading it, I thought I found two trends over there. One was a call for moderation. Maybe it's my project because I believe in moderation, but the way I was reading it, I thought that it was, it was a call for thinking of all the idea of the crisis or not of international multilateralism, what we had during the Trump administration and what we can expect of the Biden administration via the lenses of moderation. And the second one was a sense of reality that I felt taking it from Isaiah Berlin, because somewhere in your paper, you say, at the end of the day, maybe the return is what is normal behavior for USA? And that goes back, you know, to Gary's question about the, where, what is the direction? Like think that in other parts of the world, we don't think that this is, uh, Okay, normal, maybe for the US, this is the normal behavior, you know, what is for the USA. And I think this is a very, very important uh, observation that actually identifies and frames somehow our expectations. But I'm pretty sure, you know, that from tomorrow, we will continue having all these discussion debates between mainstream liberal international lawyers, Gary Simpson, you know, and the, and the others, you know, who, who challenge our faith uh, in the so-called international law. So we are, they're lawyers, you know, who oscillate balance between faith and critique. And I think, you know, this discussion was the best proof uh, of, of all this. On that note, tomorrow is a historic day, uh, no matter what. Uh, it's not only you, Amer the Americans who wait for this day, but I would say the rest of the world. And uh, I want to thank you once more, both of you, for spending an hour and a half discussing this fascinating article by Jose. Thank you very much, Jose. Thank you very much, Gary. And I'm looking forward to more meetings in person, you know, where we can, we can properly discuss whether in New York or in London in, or in other places. Thank you all. And I want to thank all the participants and Danny very much for the technical support. Thank you. Thank you very much. And looking thank forward you. to seeing you soon. Great, great to see you. you all. Bye, Jose. Bye, thank Maria. Thank you, Gary. Take care, Maria. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.